Okay, so we enter the second session of presentations from students and postdoctoral fellows. Uh, this is session two, addressing environmental impacts. And so what we're looking at here is again, the current energy system, but now instead of we're just looking at, well, not just looking at, but instead of looking at improvements to the system, we're also looking at dealing with the impacts of it or finding new ways to, to use that system, to model it, to use renewables in it, or to try and use some of its byproducts. And so we've got, again, three 10 minute presentations, three three minute pitches coming up. And so, I think without further ado, let's get our first 10-minute presentation ready. Ryan Jansen, if you'll join us at the podium. All right, hello, my name is Ryan Jansen. I'm a master's student in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And today I'm talking about assessing the impacts and costs of using low carbon energy sources uh, to produce oil sands and uh, or to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from oil sands technologies. Um, so we all know the oil sands are um, an important industry to Canada, as we saw from the research today. Uh, 2016, they contributed 5% of Canada's GDP, but also 10% of our national greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we wanted to ask the question, uh, what renewable or low carbon energy sources uh, could replace um, current natural gas consuming technologies for producing oil sands? Uh, what is their ability to get to market or market penetration potential? And, um, and what would they cost? And what is their GHG mitigation potential? As a secondary question, we were, um, we were also wondering what the impact of policy, uh, incentive policies such as carbon pricing would have on these technologies' ability to get to market. Uh, so our study method is uh, shown here. Um, we started with a literature review. Um, to understand what technologies are out there and also what sort of growth um, we're expecting in the oil sands. We developed a base case using LEAP software, or Long Range Energy Alternatives Planning. It's a bottom-up energy accounting tool, so basically we've accounted for every major energy consuming technology in the oil sands and what form of energy they consume, which allows us to see the greenhouse gas emissions and exactly where they're coming from. Uh, from there, we developed scenarios uh, based on the feasibility of technologies um, that we've seen in the literature review. So can they be incorporated into the oil sands Alberta specific context? Uh, what their market penetration is? So um, this we developed a model for. Um, rather than trying to guess how many facilities we could build uh, for different renewable energy technologies, we developed a model for um, determining how quickly these technologies could get to market based on their cost and market penetration diffusion principles. Um, and our key outputs for this are, are the GHG mitigation potential for each technology, the marginal cost of using those technologies, and the impacts of incentive policies. So this is an overview of oil sands uh, processes, quite, quite crude, but it kind of uh, communicates the main processes. Um, first is surface mining, which is basically the ore is being dug from the surface using traditional mining methods. Um, second is in situ, where steam is basically, in, in current processes, steam is pumped underground to mobilize the bitumen and then it's produced. And there we get crude bitumen, which is either upgraded or is uh, diluted so that it could be shipped to refineries and pipelines. Our model shows the current outlook for um, greenhouse gas emissions from 2018 to 2050 in the oil sands. Um, so this is a emission forecast uh, during that time, year to year, uh, broken out by subsector of the oil sands. So the key takeaway from this is that bottom wedge there for SAG-D um, is our largest source of emissions and also our largest area of expected growth. Um, so technologies there are gonna have the most impact on emissions in the oil sands, but also upgrading, surface mining, and electricity are key pieces there as well. So um, this diagram shows all the technologies we identified um, for each subsector of the oil sands uh, in the green boxes here. And um, so not all of these technologies have enough data for us to really understand their costs of incorporating them in Alberta. So the underlying technologies here are the, are the technologies we were able to um, find enough data for to develop scenarios for. And this is a list of the 11 scenarios we came up with for um, technology options. Um, we have in bitumen upgrading different forms of producing hydrogen, either through electrolysis using, 
using um, renewable energy technologies or through biomass conversion processes. Uh, in in situ, we have uh, solar steam um, or nuclear generated steam. Surface mining, we're looking at different forms of incorporating geothermal energy. And in electricity, we're looking at both nuclear electricity and hydroelectricity uh, dedicated to oil sands production. We also evaluate each technology based on um, different incentive policies. Uh, so we have a base case where no carbon pricing or any form of financial incentive is given. That allows us to evaluate them kind of on an even scale. And we have a $30 a ton, which mimics our current policy in Alberta, and a $30 increasing to $50 a ton, which follows the pan-Canadian framework from the federal government. Um, all of these technologies are evaluated based on emission factors that are outlined in the current Alberta legislature in the carbon competitiveness incentive regulation. So getting to results from our market penetration model, uh, this is in 2030, and basically each scenario here um, is shown from left to right with uh, the base case, so no carbon pricing, to the $50 a ton carbon pricing, um, broken out by subsector again. And the first key takeaway from this is that we're not seeing much penetration of any of these technologies um, in 2030. Less than 4% for any option. Um, and uh, we're also seeing right away that financial incentives such as carbon pricing are having a big impact on, on the penetration of these technologies early on. But to see real results, we kind of need to go to 2050. It takes time for these technologies to penetrate. So, so in 2050, this is what we're seeing. Um, increased penetration, especially in nuclear uh, scenarios. Um, we see right away that many of these scenarios are not gaining any market share. So um, our wind, solar, geothermal, hydroelectricity, we're not really seeing as viable technologies to dedicate to the oil sands specifically. Um, we're also seeing an interesting result with nuclear electricity where it gains zero penetration without any form of financial incentive. Uh, this is because the facilities are so big. Basically, the next two bars on that graph show one facility. So basically, one nuclear electricity facility would represent about 17% market share in the oil sands in 2050. And it needs some sort of financial incentive to justify building one. Um, now, if we go to emission results, uh, so this is year-to-year -year emissions by scenario shown here um, out to 2050. Again, we're not seeing much in most of the scenarios. The nuclear energy scenarios are the only ones that really show up on this graph, um, with nuclear steam starting to split off from the uh, reference scenario emissions. And nuclear electricity around 2046 there, um, that's where the facility gets built, and you can see a noticeable dip in expected emissions then. Um, but we also want to understand the cost of these, uh, using these options. So we developed these cost curves, which uh, outline basically the cost and mitigation potential of each scenario. So each scenario gets a rectangle here um, in the red. And basically the height of the rectangle represents the marginal cost of using that technology over against the currently used technologies in the oil sands. And the width of the box represents the GHG mitigation potential, in this case, at $30 a ton um, in 2050. So we can see that here, if we use all of our scenarios, we're getting about 74 megatons of emission mitigation potential, which represents about 2.1% of oil sands emissions during that entire time. 72% of that is coming from our nuclear steam scenario. Um, at $5 a ton, so kind of near break-even costs at that $30 a ton carbon price. And we're also getting one scenario, or nuclear electricity, that's showing negative costs. So that means in that evaluation time, we're getting cost savings with that technology um, at around 12, negative $12 a ton there. Um, so the key observations from this research are that uh, the SEGD subsector is the key area of focus. Um, any technology there is going to have the largest impact on overall emissions. Um, and, uh, and our scenario there represented about uh, 53 megatons of emission mitigation potential, or 1.5% of oil sands emissions during that time. Uh, the nuclear technologies were the most cost competitive out of all the technologies we considered. Uh, nuclear electricity at, at slight negative costs and nuclear steam near break even. And finally, removal of, so if we compare results from our $30 ton case to no carbon pricing, we get 53 megatons less 
emission mitigation potential and an $11 per ton increase in, uh, in expected costs. Finally, um, some technologies we, we believe uh, at this point at least are not viable with their current performance and costs, um, being wind and solar and geothermal being dedicated directly to oil sands processes. I'd just like to acknowledge the people that have helped us with this project and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was excellent. So we'll just give a couple of moments here for the, uh, the timers to reset, the judges to record their comments, waiting for the thumbs up. My background is in the study of history, which makes no sense for me to be part of the energy, future energy systems, but it is fascinating to me whenever I see systems engineers or economists, not there's economists here, but I always feel like as a historian, you have to wait 20 years before you start looking at the interactions between these different factors, but systems engineers get to do it in real time or looking into the future, so I'm somewhat jealous my undergrad would have gone completely differently if I could have done those things. Anyway, do we have thumbs up from the judges? Are we good to go? Timer's ready to go. In that case, allow me to welcome Ray Chin for our next 10-minute presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ray Chin, and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And the topic of our research is the fractionation of oil sands processed water and the identification of natural inorganic photosensitizer. Uh, firstly, I'll give some uh, introduction about what we are doing and why, why we do it. So uh, about 97% of the Canadian oil reserves are oil sands, and most of them are located in Alberta. And for the extraction of oil from oil sands, uh, water is needed. So uh, it would produce uh, oil sand processed water, and we call it OSPW. Even though around 90% of OSPW is recycled back into the oil extraction process, the remaining OSPW um, is stored in the tailings ponds and could not be released into the environment before treated. Um, so SPW is composed of both organic, inorganic and organic fraction. Naphthenic acid is known as a mixture of aliphatic and alisectic carboxylic acid. Uh, was reported to be responsible for the toxicity of OSPW. And so it is important to remove naphthenic acid for the treatment of OSPW. The photochemical process of OSPW can contribute to the transformation and degradation of organic contaminants. But it was, however, it was reported that the direct photolysis of naphthenic acid was not efficient because naphthenic acids uh, do not ready to absorb photons. So it is important to investigate the fossil sensitizers existing in OSBW, which could produce some reactive, uh, which could absorb light to produce some reactive uh, species for the indirect photosis of nanosynthesis. And this could provide information for the application of passive solar remediation of OSBW without the addition of external catalysts. So we aim at developing uh, methods to separate the OSPW organic and inorganic fractions and study the photolysis of naphthenic acid in OSPW with or without the uh, inorganic fraction and also identify the specific inorganic photosensitizers present in OSPW which could uh, induce or enhance the photodegradation of a model compound and we also uh, investigate the possible uh, mechanism. Uh, for the extraction of the organic fraction, we use the solid phase extraction processes and we tested different kind of cartridge with different type of solvents to see which cartridge is the most efficient to extract the organics. And for the isolation of inorganics, we packed a granular carbon column by ourselves and when the SVW is passed through the column, the organic, uh, the organic contaminants were absorbed by the GAC and the effluent was collected at the inorganic fraction. The irradiation, UV irradiation test uh, was conducted in a collimated beam apparatus equipped with a medium pressure mercury lamp uh, with a wavelength between 200 to 500 nanometers. And here are the experimental condition. Now let's look at the results. So for the separation of the organic and inorganic fractions, uh, we found that uh, the organic fraction was, uh, the extraction of organics 
uh, was most efficient by a uh, hydrophilic lipophilic balanced cartridge combined with the mass no elution. Uh, it could achieve the highest extract, uh, uh, the highest organic extract efficiency uh, with the highest uh, recovery of both uh, dissolved organic carbon and naphthenic acids. And we have also found that the, our self-packed uh, uh, gag column is applicable to obtain the YSPW inorganic fraction. And then for the photolysis of naphthenic acid with or without the inorganic fraction, we found that um, the photodegradation of naphthenic acid was enhanced in the presence of the YSPW inorganic fraction. And the uh, naphthenic acid with more carbon number and double bond equivalent were preferred to be degraded. And this was consistent with the previous study in our group uh, for the photodegradation of naphthenic acid in the presence of other uh, external photosensitizers such as chlorine and hydrogen peroxide. So this re result demonstrated that the possibility of the presence of uh, inorganic photosensitizers in OSPW. And in order to verify that, we studied the photodegradation of a uh, model compound, ACA, with or without the inorganic fraction. And we, we got the same result that in the presence of the inorganic fraction, uh, the photodegradation of the model compound was enhanced Actually, uh, the inorganic fraction induced the photodegradation of this model compound. So this result demonstrated the presence of the uh, inorganic photosensitizers in USPW. And we also found that uh, nitrate ion was the most likely inorganic ion in USPW inorganic fraction that induced this indirect photolysis process. And now we, uh, we, we uh, this figure showed us the abs absorbance of the ACA in buffer, in nitrate, and also in the OSPW inorganic fraction. And we observed that the presence of the inorganic fraction and nitrate induced the absorbance of ACA solution. So this also demonstrated the, uh, the, uh, the, they also demonstrated the presence of the inorganic photosensitizer. And the absorbance of the spectrum of ACA in OSPW inorganic fraction overlapped with that, with ACA in the nitrate solution. So this strongly suggested that nitrate was uh, uh, the dominant uh, inorganic photosensitizer in OSPW. There are uh, several different reaction, reactions that happened for, after the photolysis of nitrate ion in the aqueous uh, solution, uh, which produced both OH radical and reactive nitrogen species. So in order to um, study the mechanism of the nitrate-induced uh, photodegradation of ACA, we added two um, uh, radical scavengers. Uh, one is TBA, which can quench only OH radical, and the other one is alcohol, which can quench both OH radical and the reactive nitrogen species. And we found that with the addition of uh, 10 millimolar of TBA, uh, the degradation of ACA was inhibited but there was still 10% of ACA degraded after 60 minutes of exposure. But after adding the same amount of uh, allyl alcohol, still, uh, 10 millimolar of allyl alcohol, the degradation of ACA was completely inhibited. So this, this, this result indicated that the OH radical uh, was the dominant oxidizing species, but, uh, but reactive nitrogen species were also involved in this uh, photochemical processes. And we studied the influence of the nitrate concentration on the photodegradation process, and we, we, we observed an insignificant increase of ACA degradation after increasing the nitrate concentration from 0.3 millimolar to 3 millimolar. And th this may be because of two reasons. One is that the, uh, with the increasing nitrate concentration, more nitrite ion was in, uh, produced, which acted as an OH radical scavenger. And the other reason is that the regenerated uh, nitrate ion um, will uh, continue to initiate the concentrate, uh, initiate the uh, production of OH radical. So increasing the initial nitrate concentration is significant, insignificant. And now we studied the byproducts of the nitrate induced photodegradation of ACA. And we observed the three new peaks in the total chromatogram. Uh, and based on the, based on the 
uh, mirrored mass and the uh, elemental formula um, byproducts with six different molecular formula were produced. So our, uh, our research demonstrated the feasibility of the photosynthesis of nephsin acid in USPW due to the presence of natural photosensitizer in USPW. And nitrate could be utilized as a natural photosensitizer to induce the photooxidation process. And it could be potentially be used in a low-cost low passive solar system for the rem remanation of USPW. And, could, and it could also be utilized uh, in other wastewater treatment processes where the wastewater are exposed for natural degradation. And our results suggested that the photodegradation efficiency of OSPW treatment strategies can be enhanced in the presence of inorganic photosensitizers in OSPW. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. So we'll reset the clock again, give the judges a moment. I should mention that we are going to have a lot of talk about water in this session, and I think obviously water is a big concern with the current energy system and future energy systems for that matter too, uh, because at the end of the day, I think one of the legacies, again, speaking as the historian, we've always taken water a little bit for granted, or at least in this country we have, I should say. This country's always had an abundance of it, and so learning more about how we can do to uh, reduce our impacts on it is rather important. Judges, do I get thumbs up? We're good to go. All right, with that, Iram Zahara is going to join us for a final 10-minute presentation of this session. So again, Iram, just get set up, and then we'll start the clock. Good morning, everyone. Benjamin Franklin once said, when the well is dry, we will know the worth of water. And he is absolutely right. Water and energy infrastructures are interrelated. Today, cooling and washing has now become substantial processes for many of the industries. In return, these industries have affected the quality of water. Not only the coal and oil power plants, but also the renewable energy resources, such as the solar power and the hydroelectric power, contaminating the surface and groundwater by producing the toxic contaminants, such as the cadmium, tellurium, mercury, and methyl mercury. However, there are some technologies that are available for the treating of these contaminants from the wastewaters. But most of them are producing uh, the high quantities of the sludge, and some of them are pH dependent. Now the world has been moving to the natural biopolymers for the treating of these wastewaters. Among those natural biopolymers, the poultry feathers has gained attention, uh, has gained attention just because of their abundance as a waste material, and they possess the unique physical and chemical characteristics for the treatment of wastewater. The poultry feathers are the keratin proteins containing amino acids. Amino acids contains different functional groups such as amine group and the carboxyl group. What we can do we, by breaking these, um, by modification of these functional groups, we can enhance the surface affinity of the keratin protein so that they can easily absorb the contaminants from the wastewater. Uh, we have prepared seven of the keratin biopolymers. One of them is uh, native chicken feather without any chemical modification but some, uh, seven of them are modified uh, by treating with the different functional dopants. Then we prepared the synthetic wastewater with the ionic strength of 0 0.05 and pH 7.5, spiking with the nine of the heavy metals with a concentration of 100, 100 ppb each metal. Then we treat this synthetic wastewater with the keratin biopolymer that we have prepared, and then we analyze the adsorption concentrations of uh, the uh, toxic metals after the adsorption. But after uh, the chemical modification, we have done some characterization studies to analyze if there is a change in the surface morphology, uh, surface functionalities, and their structural integrity. First is the TGA. TGA determines the thermal stability of the samples. For the keratin biopolymers, the chemical modification did not affect their thermal stability to a greater extent. All of the keratin biopolymers were very thermally stable and did not show any of the degradation until 343 degrees centigrade. Then we have performed the DSC. Uh, DSC uh, analyzed the transition phases of the uh, sample for the keratin biopolymers. All of the keratin biopolymers have shown two uh, phase transition, a uh, two phase transitional behavior. One is near 100 degrees centigrade, that is due to the moisture loss, and the other is around 230 degrees centigrade, that is the denaturation of the keratin proteins. The FTIR analyzed uh, the surface functionality within the three regions of the keratin biopolymers, amide A region, this is the amide A region, amide 1 region, and amide 2 region. 
So the greater the peak intensity, the stronger is the hydrogen bonding. Here in this graph, you can see that some of the peak intensities are reduced and some of the additional peaks were absorbed. This, is, uh, this shows that uh, hydrogen bonding has been disrupted and some of the functional groups like carboxyl and the hydro hydroxyl group are exposed to the surface. Next is the XRD. XRD represents the two bands of the keratin proteins. One band is at 9.9. .9. That shows the alpha structure of the keratin proteins. And one broad band at 22.07. That shows the beta uh, secondary structure of the keratin proteins. Here in this graph, we can see some of the peaks have been reduced. And some of the peaks have been shifted to the uh, lower wave number. It means that the, uh, there is a disruption of the alpha structures and the beta structures and the functional groups are exposed to the surfaces. For the, from the XRD and the FTIR graph, uh, those results can be confirmed by the SCM, scanning electron microscope. KBP1 is the uh, native chicken feather without any chemical modification that has a smooth surface, but rest of them have, uh, the, uh, have not uh, the smooth surface. Some of them have dark patches, some of uh, them have the scattered adhered particles on the surface. It means that the chemical modification has exposed their surface uh, functional uh, sites to absorb the contaminants. Last but not the least, there is the adsorption experiment, and the results were highly promising. After the treatment of wastewaters with the keratin biopolymers, keratin biopolymer 1 has uh, redu um, reduced 98% of the arsenic and cadmium. Keratin biopolymer 4 has reduced 60 to 100% the vanadium and copper. Keratin biopolymer 5 reduced copper, nickel, and zinc. And uh, uh, keratin biopolymer 7 has reduced chromium about 100%. Thank you so much. That's what I have to say. Thank you, Aram. So the last time I was in here taking photos of Aram, it was because she was competing in Falling Walls, which is a three-minute thesis competition, and she just came in more than three minutes under her 10. So thank you. I guess the, uh, the experience was formative. So we'll uh, give the judges a second here, and then we'll move to the three-minute component of our talks today. Again, more water. So. The judges are all being very studious. Just give them a second. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. OK. Time to move on to the three-minute section now, which means I uh, get to welcome. Oh, so we get the timers ready to go. Abdallah Tif Abdallerman is going to start and get to the podium, get yourself set, and then we'll start the timer. Hello everyone, my name is Abdul Latif. I'm a PhD candidate and I work as a part of the uh, FACE LANA water reclamation systems uh, team, actually. Um, today I'll be talking about the structure activity relation and degradation byproducts or degradation kinetics during the anodic oxidation of naphthenic acids. So starting by giving you a quick background about the the whole research. So this is a part of a research that is focusing on the application of anodic oxidation as a treatment option for oil sands processed water. Um, the issue is that is OSPW is a complex mixture of different organics and inorganics constituents. So in order to evaluate the performance of any process for treating OSPW, um, we need to understand the selectivity and effectiveness based on the structures. This is an uh, ion mobility spectrometry uh, for a raw SPW sample. And you can see that we have so many different structures. And even within each group um, of naphthenic acids, we have different compounds with different cyclicity and carbon numbers as well. So in order to evaluate any process for the treatment of all SPW, we need to understand how it reacts in relation to the, react, um, to the structure of these nafcinic acids. Um, as I mentioned, the main purpose was to evaluate anodic oxidation under low current density. Um, so by applying this process, we are not going to be able to degrade all the fractions in all speed W. Um, so we try to understand which fraction exactly are we going to degrade by applying electro-oxidation by using um, graphite anodes or inexpensive graphite anodes and under low current density conditions. 
we investigated that by using uh, 14 different bullet compounds. Those are just part of them. And what we found was that the reactivity during amylic oxidation increased with increasing the carbon numbers of nitric acids and the cyclicity as well as the branching. However, increasing the cyclicity beyond one ring um, did not have much um, impact on the reactivity compared to the branching. Um, another important aspect we found was that under low current density conditions, 0.5 million per centimeter, for instance, the change in the graphite on the surface was not that, that severe, especially the corrosion, which means that we can apply this process under low current density to improve the biodegradability and reduce the oxidative of OSPW without wasting energy in achieving complete removal of nitric acids. That's everything. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Well said. So we'll take a pause on water for a second, and I'll invite Marina Lazichap to do her three-minute pitch. I thought you were next. Yeah, that, that's what I said. <laughs> Just give the judges a second. We'll get the clock ready to run. So hello, everyone. Welcome to my three-minute talk show. Uh, so at the beginning, I would just like to emphasize that all of us here are members of one large household, and that is our planet Earth. Each member of this household should play the role in taking care of it. Now, some members, mostly humans, will always make the mess. And there will be other members that are going to clean that mess. And now imagine that that mess is methane a highly potent greenhouse gas. Cleaners in this case are bacteria known as methanotrophs. Methanotrophs eat methane released not only by natural sources, but mostly by human industrial activities. While they are eating this methane, methanotrophs produce a large spectrum of chemical compounds known as metabolites. Now, some of those metabolites could be material for production of bioplastics or biofuels. Now, exactly those metabolites are main topic of my research. In my PhD project, I will try to address two questions, scientific one and industrial one. For scientific one, I'm very interested to find out why these methane-rich conditions are causing the production of exactly those metabolites. Like, what's biological background of that? And for the industrial one, I am very curious to find out which of these metabolites we can make commercially, which of one, them we can use to make a money of it. Now, if we think about metanotrophic cell as about the city, with all those overlapping and intercrossing roads, well, we can basically say that I'm building something like a Google map of the cell. You do have a starting point, which is methane inside the cell, and you have various roads that you can take to reach your target location. And your target location is production of bioplastics or biofuels. After I complete my Google map design, my plan is to develop efficient genetic engineering strategy that will result in highly potent methanotroph that will be able to convert methane into the valuable products like bioplastics or biofuels. In this way, we will reach minimal investments because methane is cheap industrial byproduct, so it's a waste, and we can get potentially maximal earnings. And that's the goal that the industry wants to achieve. And plus, you are saving the environment. Because remember, there is no planet B. And who would say no to that offer? Thank you, Marina. <laughs> I swear, if the next time I use Google Maps to get somewhere, I turn into bioplastic, I'm coming for you. <laughs> Can't believe people laughed at that joke. It was terrible. All right, one more three-minute pitch, and we are running ahead of schedule once again. So. Just going to give the judges a second to make sure they've got their remarks in. Counters ready to go. More thumbs up. Okay. Ling Jung Meng, please join us for your three-minute talk.
Hello, everyone. My name is Lin Jun. Today, my presentation topic is solar photocatalytic degradation of naphthenic acid using bismuth tungstate. Uh, bismuth tungstate is a semiconductor photocatalyst. A tr traditional semiconductor photocatalyst like titanium dioxide was applied to OSPW, but the disadvantage is that they could only be activated by the UV light. The UV light is only 3 to 5 percent in the whole solar light, so it's much more meaningful to explore the photocatalyst, which could be activated by the visible light. So in our work, uh, three morphologies of bismuth tungstate were prepared by the hydrothermal method, uh, including the nanoplate structure, spheroid-like structure, and the flower-like structure. The flower-like structure is the most efficient one because it has the largest surface area. And uh, the degradation experiment was conducted using the solar simulator. Uh, the UV intensity is only 0 0.015 milliwatt per square centimeter. And we applied all these materials in the both OSP, OSPW and the model compound. For OSPW, naphthenic acid contains the sulfur element uh, could be completely removed, and uh, the classical naphthenic acid could also be partially removed. Uh, the trapping measurement experiment using the model compound uh, shows that in this system, the superoxide radicals and the host are the main reactive species. So uh, in order to uh, further improve the removal efficiency, we applied two methods. One is by adding the manganese, which could react with the superoxide radicals to generate the travelant manganese. The second one is uh, to uh, prepare the hydrojunction structure for the catalyst. So we believe uh, in this research, we will, apply the, we will provide the valuable information for the removal of naphthenic acid by the engineered passive solar-based uh, approaches. Thank you. And with that, we are done with session two. So let the judges do their marking. Here's the next step. We are going to re reconvene here at 1 o'clock. So we've got an hour. Anybody who's doing a main stage presentation, feel free to visit us in the green room. Uh, there will be some benefits to subjecting yourself to the microphone there. Everybody else, feel free. Nobody. So when we get back to the poster competition, nobody is required to be at their posters for the next hour because it's, you know, it's lunchtime. So if people want to go and grab lunch, they can. That said, if you want to be at your posters and talking with people, it's a great time to chat. It's a great time to point out that they have ballots in their name tags. Whatever you decide to do, that's entirely up to you. And then everybody reconvene here at 1 o'clock. And this afternoon, we're going to have two sessions looking at our themes that are developing renewable energy technologies, and then one more session dealing with the human side of energy. And then we've got our keynote, that person who texted in the first session. So everybody back here at 1 o'clock.